Thank you, everyone, for tuning in this morning. My name is uh, Daniel Watford. I'm one of the transplant nephrologists here at University of Washington. And today I'm going to be chatting with you guys about uh, APOL1 kidney risk variants and the Apollo study. I do not have any disclosures this morning. And so objectives for our talk. So first, I want to just discuss briefly the history of the APOL1 gene. I do want to talk to you guys about the clinical implications of APOL1 kidney disease risk variants in African Americans. I also want to discuss the APOL1 Long-Term Kidney Transplantation Outcomes Network Study, also known as the Apollo Study. And very briefly towards the end, I want to just discuss future implications and, and directions uh, around uh, APOL1 testing and uh, next steps in the Apollo Study. All right, so first off, a little bit of history about the APOL1 gene. So we know there are several different apolipoproteins uh, denoted by A through E, there's H, there's L, and there's also lowercase a, excuse me. And then within that, there are several subclasses. Uh, so the APOL gene cluster, which is of particular interest for us, uh, is located on human chromosome 22, the Q12 locus. And there are six related APOL1 genes denoted one through six. And of course, the one of particular interest is APOL1 gene. So in terms of function, we, do, we know that uh, these APOL genes are part of the HDL family. Uh, and traditionally, they're thought to be involved in lipid and cholesterol transport. But now there's evidence that uh, APOL uh, does function actually as ion channels of intracellular membranes and is involved in mechanisms of cell death. And so as I mentioned, of course, the APOL1 gene is the one of particular interest for us uh, from a renocentric pr perspective. Um, and we know that it's only found in primates, but interestingly enough, it's not found in all primates. And so for evolutionary biology fans here, so APOL1 likely arose about 30 million years ago um, through a series of gene duplication events. Uh, this is after the split of new and old world uh, monkeys, but before the split of old world and some of the larger primates, such as gorillas and humans. Um, and interestingly enough, our closest uh, primate relative in the chimpanzees, we have not identified APOL1 uh, in, in chimpanzees, but of course, it, we know it's present in, in humans. Sorry, why am I freezing here? All right. Um, so a little bit about more background on the APOL1. Uh, so it is the only member of the uh, APOL gene locus with signal peptide at the end terminus. And this is thought to allow for export uh, from the cell so they can function extra, extracellularly. Um, you know, the protein uh, does circulate at high levels in the serum on HDL complexes, as I mentioned. Mostly it's produced in the liver, but it is expressed in multiple organs, including the brain, the pancreas, and of course the kidney, as we, many of us know. Um, and as mentioned, the APOL1 particularly is the only one believed to function extracellularly. Thought to play a role in inflammatory pathways. Um, we have been able to identify some APOL ones that do not have that signal peptide. And the thought is that these most likely function intracellularly. But I think uh, some of the details of what they do is still being uh, worked out at this moment. So I have a figure here. And this figure just demonstrates the three distinct domains of the protein molecule. Um, and a particular interest is uh, the serum resistance associated binding domain or SRA uh, domain located here uh, on the C terminal. Um, and that's thought to provide, well, I'll talk about it here in a bit, but thought to provide resistance to a specific parasitic infection, but also maybe the, the portion of the protein that is problematic from a kidney disease standpoint. All right. So, uh, Going back to the APOL1 kidney risk variants, and really, I should say, these are really more, these are really alleles as opposed to variants. Um, they were first identified in 2010 through collaborative effort led by researchers out of Boston, particularly Dr. Martin Pollack out of uh, Harvard. Um, prior to this, there was no known kidney disease link uh, with these variants. And uh, the high-risk genotype is, uh, found in up to 13% of African Americans. Uh, it is inherited through an autosomal recessive inheritance pattern. 
as I mentioned, it is believed to provide evolutionary uh, protection from African sleeping sickness, also known as trypanosomiasis, which is a doesn't quite roll off the tongue very nicely, uh, caused by the uh, trypanosoma infection that is transmitted by, well, does anyone know what, what this is? What organism this is? Oh, I heard that from the audience. I hear, I think someone outside my office here. That is correct. It is the Setsi fly. Very good. And so, yes, this is the, the vector for transmission of African sleeping sickness. All right. So the mutations. So there are two independent APOL1 mutations known as G1 and G2, with G0 being the wild type. Um, all genotypes confer similar risk for kidney disease. And the high-risk genotypes that we're speaking about are G1, G1, G2, G2, and also G1 and G2. Is, as I mentioned, it's an autosomal recessive uh, inheritance pattern. And the mutations, um, particularly the G2 mutation, uh, is thought to prevent uh, the serum resistance uh, domain, uh, serum resistance virulence factor that is produced by the trypanosoma organism from binding to the SRA domain and thus inactivating uh, APOL1. Um, and it's thought that these APOL1 proteins have lytic activity uh, against the trypanosomal uh, organism. Both um, genotypes encode uh, amino acid changes at the C terminus, serum resistance associated binding domain, as I mentioned. All right. So what are the mutations? So the G1 mutation uh, is due to two, at least the two uh, amino acid substitutions, uh, substituting a serine for a glycine at the 342nd uh, amino acid locus, as well as a methionine for isoleucine at the 384th amino acid and the polypeptide chain of the protein. The G2 mutation leads to a six base pair deletion essentially leads to deletion of the amino acids um, asparagine at the 388th amino acid and the polypeptide chain and deletion of tyrosine at the 389th uh, amino acid um, in the polypeptide chain. Um, the allele frequencies of G1 and G2 are thought to be about 23% and 14% respectively in African Americans. Um, and it's believed that 12 to 14% of African-Americans possess two high-risk variants or the high-risk genotype, as I mentioned. All right, so mechanisms of disease. So, you know, kind of a large graphic here, but essentially ApoL1 is thought, uh, ApoL1 proteins are thought to form uh, potassium permeable uh, cation selective pores in the plasma membranes of cells. And expression of APOL1 variants results in the net loss of intracellular potassium, which causes activation of stress-activated protein kinases, um, specific, specifically SAPK, P38, and JNK cascade, which leads to cytotoxicity uh, and cell death. Um, so when talking about uh, providing um, immunity against the trypanosoma infection. So APOL1 inserts into membranes and forms pores, leads to lysis of the parasites. Um, and then as you see in the, the graphic here, this demonstrates the APOL1 inserting into the lysosome here. And subsequently this leads to death of the parasite and protection from African sleeping sickness. However, on the flip side, this is problematic when we're talking about um, involvement in our podocytes. So in podocytes, it's believed to disrupt uh, the ability of the cell to remove unnecessary or dysfunctional components, thought to induce mitochondrial respiration defects um, with ATP depletion, and also, as I mentioned, inducing potassium efflux and activating the stress response pathways that subsequently lead to cell death and, and loss of our podocytes in, our, in, in kidneys. So the Kidney Disease Association. So the high-risk variants are thought to account for, I've seen estimates as high as as much as 70% of the excess risk of kidney disease in African-Americans are those who possess the, the high-risk genotypes. This can lead to increased risk for FSGS, hypertensive nephrosclerosis, lupus nephritis, even diabetic kidney disease, and HIV-associated uh, FSGS and nephropathy. The high-risk gene vir variants are virtually non-existent in non-African-American ethnicities. Um, and I mentioned, as I mentioned, as much as 70% of the excess risk for ESRD and FSGS among African Americans may be thought to be due to possessing this high risk genotype. 
um, middle-aged African-American adults may experience twice the two times greater risk of progression to ESRD versus low-risk carriers or, or whites who do not possess um, the high-risk genotype. But I do think it's important to remember that just because you have the high-risk genotype does not mean that the penetrance of kidney disease is 100%. It's actually more likely closer to 14, 15% uh, based on recent studies. And so, um, and so the thought is that maybe there's a second hit component that that's accounting for um, why some patients experience uh, progressive kidney disease and, and ESRD versus others do not who also may have the high risk genotype. So, um, so a lot of the uh, data regarding uh, the involvement of a APOL1 high-risk genotypes in African-Americans comes from two major studies, and I'll talk a little bit about those two studies. So the first one is known as the African-American Study of Kidney Disease and Hypertension, or the ASH study. And this the ASH study ran from 1995 to, to 2007, and this study prospectively evaluated 693 patients uh, who self-identified as Black, who also had chronic kidney disease that was uh, attributed to hypertension at that time and did not have diabetes uh, and for which genotyping data was available or was obtained. Um, and the composite outcome that they looked at was ESR was a, a composite of ESRD or doubling of the serum creatinine over the study follow-up. And not to belabor too much, but here I'll bring your attention here uh, to the area here circled in red. And as I mentioned, um, we do know this is uh, a autosomal dominant, uh, I mean, autosomal recessive inheritance pattern. So as you see here, looking at the outcome of, of ESRD, the hazard ratio, looking at those with zero copies or just one copy of the APOL1 high-risk variant is being our baseline. With those who have two copies of, of the high-risk APOL1 variant, the risk of progression to ESRD is as much as double, two times as, as, as high in those. And then looking at our composite, uh, outcome of ESRD or doubling of serum creatinine, we see a similar trend here uh, with double the risk of, in those who have uh, the high-risk genotype or both or, or two high-risk alleles at the APOL1. All right, so another study. The other study is the Chronic Renal Insufficiency Cohort or CRIC study. And this study ran from June 2003 to August of 2008. And a much larger study involved uh, almost uh, 3,300, 3,288 black and white patients with the EGFR between 20 and 70 mils per minute. And out of those 2,000, 2, excuse me, 955 patients uh, with genotyping data were, at, were analyzed, about half of which had diabetes. And they did stratify based on uh, the presence of diabetes uh, or lack of diabetes. And their outcome was a renal, was a renal event, which again was similar to, similar to the last study was defined as a diagnosis of ESRD or a reduction of GFR by 50% from baseline or essentially a doubling of um, their serum creatinine you can think of. So again, um, I'll bring your attention here. Um, Similar duration of follow-up across the groups, although a little bit uh, longer follow-up in those with diabetes compared to those without diabetes. Um, and then I, I show you here, um, so you can see these are Black patients with APOL1 low-risk variants versus those with high-risk variants. And about 9.5 per 100 person years experienced um, the renal event I mentioned versus 13.7 in the high-risk group. Um, and then incident ESRD, you can see was also higher, 6.2% in those with the low risk uh, variants versus those 8.1% with the higher risk variants. And a similar trend also in those um, who, have di who had diabetes, this is those without diabetes, this is those with diabetes. Um, seeing about 20% 20, uh, 20 of the patients with uh, having a renal vent uh, with the low risk variants, versus as high as 31% in those who had um, the high-risk variant. Um, another way to look at it is uh, the difference in the eGFR slope decline uh, per year, or rate of GFR decline. And I'll bring your attention here. So again, this is looking at our change in slope. So 
this is comparing all black patients versus all white patients. Similar um, degree and slope decline, but when you're looking at black patients with the high risk APOL1 genotype compared to whites, their GFR seems to decline about double the rate as those um, or as those who do not have the, the high risk variant. Um, and that kind of holds true across uh, with patients who have diabetes as well as who do not have diabetes, and also the risk of the composite renal outcome of, as I mentioned, ESRD or, or uh, decline by NGFR about 50% was also similar in both groups. All right, and then this just shows um, a different way of showing that, that same data. Here in the top, uh, we have our box and whisker plops. The top left is in patients with diabetes versus those without diabetes. And here on the bottom, I have Captain Meyer curves also on the left, patients with diabetes and those without diabetes. And then looking at the decline in, in, in GFR slope, Black patients with, the high, with high risk genotype have a much uh, uh, more rapid decline in GFR compared to white patients. Black patients with the low risk genotype have a similar change in GFR to those with whites. And then Black patients with with the high risk genotype versus the low risk genotype, we see that the high risk genotype also has a more um, higher decline of GFR as well. And then looking at the Kaplan Meyer plots here, they show a similar, they paint a similar picture here. You can see um, these are, you know, on the on the y axis, the patients free from our composite renal outcome. And as you see, uh, over time, patient, black patients. The bottom line here is black patients with the APOL1 high risk variants. This middle line here is those with the low risk genotype. And that uh, top line is our white patients. And so as you can see, the APOL1 gene may not be accounting for all of uh, the um, renal outcomes here. But uh, as, as you can, because as you can see, black patients still do poor compared to our, their white counterparts. But certainly those with the higher risk genotype do, do worse than any other group. All right. For the sake of time, I'm going to gloss over this, but this is a graphic that demonstrates the risk of various APOL1-associated kidney disease entities over various stages of, of life and ages. All right. So excuse me. what about transplantation? Um, as I mentioned, I am one of the transplant nephrologists in his interest of mine. So um, and this is where Apollo comes in. Um, okay, and by Apollo, so this is Apollo, the god of archery, healing, and diseases, and sun and light. Um, that's not the Apollo that I'm referring to, of course, for our study. And then, of course, I am kind of a, a little bit of a self-proclaimed space nerd. And so, you know, we recently celebrated the 50th anniversary. Well, we're approaching the 54th anniversary now of the Apollo 11 uh, uh, launch where we sent astronauts to the moon back in July of 1969, but that is not what we were referring to today either. <laughs> so of course what I'm talking about, and I alluded to it earlier, is the APOL1 long-term kidney transplantation uh, outcomes network uh, study or the Apollo study. And what this is, it's a large multi-site prospective observational cohort study. Does anyone know where this is here? I cheat a little bit because it's right in kind of my backyard. I grew up very close to here, but I don't hear the peanut gallery this time, but uh, all right. Well, this is a uh, Wake Forest University Health Sciences. It's, it's in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I'm originally from North Carolina. I'm actually from Durham, North Carolina, but my mother's from Winston-Salem and I spent many weekends growing up at my grandparents' house in Winston-Salem and, and uh, around the Wake Forest campus. Um, very nice campus, small, small school, but very nice. Um, so, the Wake Forest is the coordinating center for the, the Apollo study, and this is a, a large collaboration, collaborative study uh, involving the National Institutes of Diabetes and Digestive Kidney Disease, or NIDDK, the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, and the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious uh, Disease. All right, so what are the aims of the Apollo study? So Firstly, it's the, one of the aims is to attempt to improve outcomes after kidney transplantation and to improve safety of living kidney donation based upon variation in the apolipoprotein L1 gene. Another aim is to prospectively assess the effects of kidney risk variants in the apol one gene on outcomes for kidneys from donors 
uh, with recent African ancestry and the recipients of their kidneys after both deceased as well as living donor kidney transplantation. And also the aim is to study the impact of APOR1 kidney risk variants on the health of living kidney donors with recent African uh, ancestry. And interesting, this is the first study to prospectively obtain APOL1 uh, genotype data on donors, excuse me, and recipients to test whether reduced kidney allograft survival is due uh, to donor and or recipient APOL1 genotypes, or whether other APOL1 gene or environmental interactions exist between donors uh, and recipients. And the hope is that, you know, this study will provide further clarity on the benefits and the implications of routinely genotyping uh, African-American donors, as well as broadly genotyping our entire donor pool, because we have this information available to us now. So what to do with it, essentially, is the question. All right, so further, uh, more details about the Apollo study. So the official start date of the Apollo study was May 16th of 2019. There are 13 clinical centers uh, operating under Wake Forest as the coordinating center. Uh, the estimated study completion date is September of this year, September 2023. The study population is all participating transplant programs in the continental U.S., including Puerto Rico. Now, there is some variability, I must say. All transplant programs ultimately are not submitting data to Wake Forest for various reasons. A lot of it may be just due, with, due to logistics and, and ability to, to set up the study at each site. Um, but it's a big study is the point. Um, in terms of living donor recruitment, looking at living donors with self-reported recent African ancestry, shooting for approximately 700. Um, and by recent African ancestry, this means having similar genetic makeup to those currently residing in Africa, so African-Americans, Afro-Caribbeans, Hispanic, Black, or African. Um, also looking to recruit uh, recipients from eligible living or deceased donor um, with recent African ancestry. Again, as I mentioned, approximately 700 living donors and approximately 2,600 deceased um, donors. And this also includes recipients of multi-organ kidney transplants, pediatric in-block transplants, and dual kidney transplants as well. So what are the outcome measures that, that we're looking for? So one, the goal of recruitment is hoping to recruit about 4,000 to 5,000 participants, and they're still recruiting. And, and uh, the Apollo study will continue re uh, recruitment through May 31st of 2023. And all that it requires at the time of enrollment is a single blood and a single urine sample um, that's collected and sent off to, to Wake Forest um, for further processing. The primary endpoint, excuse me, is time from kidney transplant to, cell to death censored kidney allograft failure. And this is measured in days um, with the projected follow-up up to 4.5 years. And some secondary endpoints are rate of change in serum creatinine concentration, rate of change in EGFR using the CKD epi calculation, time to sustain development of overt proteinuria in the outpatient setting. And in terms, and what they mean by overt proteinuria, they define it as a urine protein to creatinine ratio greater than 500 milligrams per gram, or a 24-hour urine measurement of greater than 500 milligrams or persistent one plus proteinuria on uh, your analysis. And lastly, uh, another secondary outcome is rate of change in EGFR and quantitative proteinuria from baseline uh, pre-donation levels in living kidney donors. So as I mentioned, there are 13 uh, clinical centers operating under uh, Wake Forest for the Apollo study, and I've listed them here uh, with the closest one uh, to University of Washington uh, being uh, University of California in San Francisco. And within uh, operating sort of underneath these clinical centers, there are about approximately 100 engaged sites and 46 non-engaged sites who are providing data and samples to Wake Forest. And how do they define engaged versus uh, non-engaged sites? Well, it's pretty simple, but basically um, you were defined as an engaged site if your projected recruitment um, was greater than uh, 10 expected eligible transplants uh, over the course of the study period versus non-engaged if you expected to have less than 10 expected eligible transplants. As we know, there are different regions in the country where, you know, uh, there are higher or lower rates of African-American kidney donation as well as uh, transplantation. And so um, that is where the engaged versus the non-engaged um, sites come from. 
Now, to my knowledge, and anyone who may know differently in the audience, please correct me, but I don't believe us at University of Washington have been actively submitting uh, data to, uh, to Wake Forest as part of the um, Apollo study. But initially, uh, when the study was when, um, being started, University of Washington was considered to be a non-engaged site. And where I trained, where I was at prior to this was I was at Stanford and we were an engaged site also under the same um, umbrella with uh, UCSF as our uh, clinical center. All right, and I'll move a little bit quickly here just because I know we're close to time. So this here is Stanford. This is where I was prior to this and I played a big part in our, our site, um, played a big role in our uh, site recruitment and organization of our site-specific Apollo study. Uh, working under Dr. Jane Tan, who was the site-specific PI. Um, and by the time I left Stanford in June, um, we had screened over 350 patients and consented and processed 17 participants, all uh, of which were recipients. Um, and currently to date, uh, well, I guess I should say uh, about a month ago, um, was the last time I checked back, um, Stanford has screened about 466 patients um, with 26 consented and processed uh, with one more still awaiting consent, uh, as well as one potential living donor um, that was approached at the time had not yet been enrolled, but um, hope was to discuss um, and get that patient enrolled. All right, so I just wanna provide a few status updates um, for Apollo. So. Um, the Apollo Clinical Centers, as I mentioned, will continue recruitment through the end of May of this year. Um, as of the most recent data I have in terms of outcomes, as of uh, October 27th of this past year, there were over 4,000 deceased donors enrolled with um, appropriate DNA data submitted. Approximately 55% of the Apollo deceased donor kidney transplant recipients are Black. Um, at current enrollment, looking at an average of about 27 deceased donors per week uh, nationally and expect to have over 5,000 unique deceased donors linked to uh, is almost 7,000 deceased donor kidney transplants uh, in UNOS. But one thing I should point out is that there has been very low level uh, living donor recruitment for the study. And um, because of that, there's gonna be a supplemental study called the Apollo uh, Leto uh, study or the Living Donor Extended Time Outcome Study that's going to be performed out at uh, through UCSF. And this is going to be looking at outcomes pertaining to living donation African Americans because in, in part of the Apollo initial Apollo study, looking at our recruitment numbers, it looks to be it's likely going to be underpowered to detect um, the outcomes we're looking for. So a sub, sub, supplemental study is is warranted. Um, all right, a few other updates here. Um, so overall, the rate of having both kidneys discarded from out of the 4,197 donors that I mentioned was about 26%. And out of those recruited for the study, about 12, a little over 12% of the deceased donors do in fact have the high risk genotype. Um, and through June 30th of this past year, there have been 138 graft failures uh, with the expectation of approximately 100 approximately 100 deceased donor kidney transplant graft failures per year. The rate of DGF is about 28.6% up to that point. And, you know, comparing this to national incidence of, of DGF, the most recent data I could find, so there's an incidence of about 3%, 23%, and 31% incidence of DGF uh, when you're looking at talking about living donors, standard deceased uh, donors, and what we used to consider expanded criteria donor or, or higher KDPI uh, donors respectively. And this is from uh, SRTR data, most recently from the last I had was 2015 with DGF data. Um, and then there have been 292 deaths uh, up to uh, June of last year with the mean 12 month creatinine of about 1.5 um, milligrams per deciliter and 12 month overt proteinuria of about 16%. So how are we doing on time? I guess I'm kind of running over time. So I'll finish here briefly. So uh, I want to finish here just going over, uh, there are some therapeutics in development, interestingly enough. And this is something I learned about actually when I went to ASN uh, this past year in Orlando. Um, 
There are several potential therapy approaches under investigation, including targeting APOL1 gene expression, protein function, and its downstream effects. And one in particular is known as enaxaplin, or VX147 being the study name. Uh, and this is an oral small molecule APOL1 inhibitor that's under investigation for management of APOL1 mediated kidney disease and FSGS. And it's currently undergoing phase two and three trials uh, at the moment, and it's out of Vertex Pharmaceuticals. So this is really promising um, that there are therapeutics arising and it may change how we go about looking for APOL1 high risk um, variants, uh, particularly in our kidney transplant donors and recipients going forward. And so some future implications. So how, I think some questions arise from this and such as how we use APOL1 high risk kidney disease uh, variants status in place. Is this something that will replace race in the KDPI calculation. And I suspect that may be where we're going and I just think that's probably the right thing to do. Um, who should be screened um, for high risk APOL1 uh, variants? Should we screen all potential kidney transplant recipients of African-American descent? Um, and, you know, I think that question is not as simple as it sounds. I think we don't know quite what to do. And some programs think maybe we should, some think maybe not because we don't exactly know what to do with it. Remembering that everyone who has this high-risk variant does not develop kidney disease. And we're already talking about a population where rates of transplant are the lowest and also rates of kidney donation are also uh, the lowest. And so being very careful not to create, I think, barriers for transplantation in this marginalized group, as well as donation from this, um, from this group, but also trying to ensure, you know, that we are taking kidneys from the patients who it's safest to do that from and are at lowest risk or are not at the highest risk of developing CKD and ESRD after donation. Um, again, I think the same question arises, should we screen all African-American donors? Um, I think maybe, maybe not. I think it could, I could easily see that being a slippery slope and leading to declining um, otherwise possibly suitable, suitable donors for donation. Um, and so I think it's, a, it's something that we have to take um, very slowly. And, 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 and I think having more data and being able to further determine who exactly is gonna develop this disease, uh, who's gonna develop ESRD relates to APOL1 high-risk variants um, because it's not everyone that has these high-risk genotypes. And I think the fact that there are potential therapeutics targeting APOL1 expression and potential function uh, and protein function in the treatment of APOL1 mediated kidney disease is very promising and may um, allow for more widespread screening, knowing that we have a therapeutic option available if needed. So um, I think that brings us to the end of my presentation. So here are some of my references. And then with that, when I'm outside the hospital, these are my better halves who uh, keep me busy. Uh, this is my wife, my two dogs, and my son, Axel. Um, and with that, open to any questions. I'm sorry for running a bit over in time. Thank, thank you, Dr. Watford. Amazing scope from cellular physiology up to epidemiology and therapeutics. And then, of course, you dropped some, some of the most interesting questions about how we actually apply this information at the end. So surely a lot of discussion. Um, but uh, so maybe I'll just go with one question from Dr. DeBoer in the chat, if you can see it. Um, yes, my understanding is that APOL1 risk of graft failure goes with the kidney, i.e. it's the donor genotype that influences outcomes, but that we have relatively fewer data on. Yes, very, very good question, Dr. DeBoer. Um, I think, you know, I think a lot of us are anxiously awaiting um, uh, further data from APOL1. And as I said, I have just bits and pieces that, you know, I was able to get from a, uh, from a presentation at, at, uh, at ASN. But I don't have, I don't have that information at the moment. I don't know. Um, I, I think you are correct. Yes, it does go um, with the kidney, but I don't think that's completely worked out. Um, I think there may be a component um, in the serum that may also be a contributing factor. So I think a lot of that is to be determined. That seems a real uh, advantage and, and strength of Apollo to really have both data. It's an exciting study. Thanks for updating us.
Yeah, yeah, definitely. And a ball mentions a comment here. We are, we are one of the, yes, I was, I definitely, I saw that as well. We were one of the sites for the A401 inhibitor study and we'll start. That's very exciting news. Um, a ball, Bessie and myself are currently working to set up. Yes, yes, exactly. So exciting. So maybe we're not contributing so much to the, uh, you know, the Apollo data, but, you know, this is very exciting in terms of uh, arising therapeutics for treatment of um, this disease that invariably infects, affects uh, a very marginalized population with kidney disease. Well, thank you. 